and we want to just bound, minimize the number of these IOs needed in order to do some sort of computation here. Um, yeah, so, so, um, so what we're going to be talking about today is some, some, uh, some slight changes in this model. Right, so, so uh, as I mentioned earlier, your computer usually does not look exactly like this. You don't have just um, one CPU, some RAM, and then a disk. It's usually more complicated with a much taller um, hierarchy. You may have multiple CPUs. You may even have multiple disks. Um, so what happens when we, ch when we change this model? So we'll talk about how it affects the um, um, some of these um, these asymptotic bounds, how it affects things in, in practice, and then, you know, if you have questions about other variants, I'm, I'm happy to kind of discuss this, make this a little bit more, um, more open-ended. Um, so, ju just as a reminder, um, the input size um, is n. Um, um, this is the block size. Um, this is. Um, um, the memory size, and um, so a couple of in, important bounds is it takes O of n over b IOs to just scan the data to find, say, the maximum element in your data, and it takes O of n over b log base m over b n over b IOs to Sort. And so this is in the basic model. So some of the things we'll look at is, oh, and, uh, and if you build a B tree, then you can do log base B n over B um, IOs to um, up, up to search. Um, so, uh, so, 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 We'll look at some other variants of this model and see how these, these bounds change. Okay, so the, the first thing we'll look at is we'll try and kind of get rid of the problem where there's actually multiple bottlenecks in the, in the hierarchy. And there's something called a um, 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 cache oblivious. Um, that's key there. Um, algorithms. Um, okay. Um, um, so the goal is a a bound on on the IOs um, in terms of n. M and B, um, but um, with no um, knowledge of M and, and B, right? So you want to get some bounds that look like these, right? In order to get the scanning bound, I need to know, I need, in order to write this down properly, I need to have B in here. So I'd like a bound that depends on B. But I don't want to have to know what this B is ahead of time. Right? I, I, I don't want to know what this block size is. This is the size of, um, you know, if I move something from disk to the RAM, I move it in a chunk of a large block. Right? Um, so what's the advantage of not knowing these values M and B ahead of time? You can, uh, the algorithm that you develop can fit into uh, Multiple architectures. Mm. All right. So, so I can I can develop the algorithm and and then deploy it without knowing what the architecture is, right? So, so, so I don't have to know what this what this setup of my computer is. Say I'm running it on both machines. I don't want to recompile it on each machine uh, um, before I run it, right? So, um, so that's one advantage. Um, so. Um, so don't need to um, find B and recompile. Sometimes, 
as I mentioned before, sometimes you can find B in the settings on the system, and then you can build it as a, as a templated variable and then compile, recompile the, the algorithm on each machine. But if you, if you don't, you know, the, 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 this can be a pain. Sometimes it's hard to figure out what B is, and you can do it through experiments, but those are even, even more of a, of a pain. Um, okay, so, so what's another? Is yep. it acceptable to make M and B be runtime parameters that could be set at runtime somehow? Or are we trying to eliminate even the need for that? Um, so we're trying to even eliminate the need for that. Okay. Right. Uh, yeah. Uh, From which I infer that there aren't typically operating system parameters we can call to get values for those things and then... Yeah, it, um, in most cases there are. Um, so, yeah, let's not worry about runtime parameters. You could implement it that way, but it's, um, it's, 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 it'd be more efficient if you could let the compiler uh, know that ahead of time. Isn't the main advantage that once you have this memory memory architecture, which means that you have larger larger space, um, so slower slower space, but get faster and faster access to data, it means that algorithms will run relatively in the same um, the same fashion. So basically, you can you can you can run it on a small computer, you can run it on like a cluster of computers, or whether since you keep this memory architecture, the model of memory architecture yeah. the same, the algorithms will perform pretty good. Yeah, so, um, well, so, th there are a couple questions about the, the clusters of computers, which, which I'll come and, and talk about a little bit more. The, these, these don't really fit this model where you have um, data which is, um, which you have to access in blocks and then everything looks like a regular random access machine um, that's below that with the single CPU. We'll look at other variants of this where we have multiple disks or we have multiple CPUs in a second. Um, but right now I'm just saying we have this model but we don't want to know M and B ahead of time. The, um, there's another advantage other than this point here um, that it's kind of based on this model architecture, but extending it in a non, in a, in a way that's not making it parallel in some sense. Um, so what if the architecture looked like, um, um, I have the cloud, um, I have my disk, I have my um, RAM, which is sitting attached uh, onto my motherboard, um, and then I have um, like an L2 cache, and then I have my CPU. Okay. Um, so, so, so each of these elements may may work where there is some at each stage there is some size of um, there's some block here where this is stored, um, and and the block size will be different at each level. <laughs> Typically, in the L2 cache, you'll have a block size as well, but it'll be smaller than that used in RAM. And you you, you may store things in the cloud. This is not necessarily true. You often may want to stream stuff from the cloud, but, but if you're doing something uh, where you're Trying to verify the you know the, the the thing in the cloud, you may have a larger chunk, so you have to do fewer things. You have to do a hash code on it. You may have a different block size here. You have multiple levels, and each of them has some uh, um, has um, has some bottleneck. And the model we talked about here is basically saying that this part, anything in here is free and anything in here takes the same amount of time to get. But really, if something doesn't fit on the disk, it may be in, in the cloud or, or something like that. Or it, when we talk um, later about things like MapReduce, you'll, you'll see that when things are transferred between computers, often you, 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 sh you shut the whole um, system down, you have a round of computation, 
and you move a whole bunch of stuff at one um, at once, much larger than than one block size. So when you have this whole hierarchy, there may be multiple different block sizes and multiple different sizes of the memory with respect to that block size that you want to optimize all at once. You want your algorithm to run fast at every stage of this hierarchy. And so if you don't, if you have an algorithm which is, which is fast in terms of M and B for every value of M and B, um, then it will work for every level of the hierarchy um, simultaneously. So usually the, high, the highest level is the one that is, um, is causing the largest bottleneck. But it could be that you know, most of your is on disk, but some of it is, is on the cloud. And so the bottlenecks are kind of about equal to each other because most of the IOs happen between disk and RAM, but there are a few even more expensive ones between the cloud. So you kind of want to make sure you're not thrashing at, uh, um, at either of these levels. Yeah. No duration on cloud nine. Yeah, yeah. I'm on, I'm on cloud nine. I guess that's that's the oh, that's the point, right? It's perfect. Um, all right. So, um, so so there are these ways of trying to design algorithms that manage to have good bounds, but without knowing M and B out of them. Okay, but. Um, okay, but these typically don't work quite as well in practice as if you can pre-specify the values of M and B and then hard code them into your, into your code. You can often get those to be working you know, significantly better. And in some cases, the, 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 the asymptotic bounds are not as, as good. There are things we can't do. Um, in order for these items to work, you need some, um, some modeling assumptions. Um, so, um, so, so the first is that you're dealing with an ideal cache. So this means that the, um, the, the well, every time you put something new in your cache, you have to replace one of the things which is, is already there. And the one that you replace is going to be the, the one that's going to be used the furthest in the future. Right, so always um, replace the furthest in future. Um, so, so this is not something you can possibly actually do, right? Because you don't know which one is going to be used the furthest in the future until you actually see the future. Um, but if if you do something simple like um, um, the least recently used, this is only going to be off by a constant. Right, so if you're, um, so doing, using the least recently used is going to work just as well. So this, this assumption is probably, is, is probably fine. Um, so in practice we use approximation of least recently used. Yeah, so it'll, it'll affect the bounds a little bit in, in, in theory, but they're theoretical bounds. So, and people don't always use least recently used. Sometimes they try and use more advanced things, which may do better than this. But it's really hard to beat um, least recently used unless your your OS or compiler somehow knows something specific about the sort of workloads that you have. Um, Who did LR use stand for? Least recently used. Okay. The one, the thing admitted from the cache is the one that was least recently accessed by the CPU or a lower level of cache. So that's a pretty standard caching technique. Um, uh, um, um, the second assumption is, um, is um, full associativity. That means that um, any any block that you grab from disk can is allowed to go uh, go anywhere in the cache. So any uh, block can uh, go anywhere. Um, so is anywhere here? Um, um, so is anyone in the class um, um, work on architecture or 
you know, has, has taken the architecture class here. Um, I took it at another institution. Some place. So, so, is, so how valid is this assumption? Any block for, can go anywhere? For disk, okay, this that, is not yeah. for disk that often holds this is pretty well. For RAM caches, often not. Yeah. No, this is not valid. I mean, for yeah. full assisted, for, if you have full assisted, then yeah, but no one has full assisted. Yeah, yeah. So, 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 so typically what happens is any block, there's, there's, a, there's maybe eight places in the, in the cache that go. I don't know, maybe the constants are different from when I was reading about this. But the, it, it will usually have essentially the, the same last few um, <coughs> items of its address, hmm? the same in the cache as it does on, on, the, on the disk in some ways. So there are only a limited number of places it can go. So um, though you can, you can avoid um, this uh, with some tricks with hashing. Um, so if you, if, if you, if you play some, some tricks with this and maybe you, you store the block in a couple different places on, on, on disk, you can usually get around this. And because usually there are, um, the, the, there are, um, Say if there are eight places it can go, usually there's not a problem with, with, the, with, the, um, with the collisions. If, if the blocks are essentially stored randomly on disk, the probability that all, you're going to fill up all, all eight things at once is probably not going to be so bad. Maybe you're going to fill up the cache a little bit sooner than you would otherwise because of these conflicts, um, but usually not by much more than, than a constant sooner. So your, your actual size of your, your value m may end up being a bit smaller in practice than, than what you actually want. Um, so, but you, it, it, and this will assume that the, that the cache actually has full associativity. And this isn't going to break things too bad. Um, but does that violate our assumption of cache characteristic of obliviousness if we have to start making assumptions to set up a hash algorithm? Well, so I, I think the hashing is that if you, if, you, if you randomly order your blocks on disk, it'll essentially correspond with random locations in the cache. And so then the prob probability of collision is random. And so in, in practice, it's fairly rare for your, your memory to fill up much earlier than it would if you did have full associativity. Okay. So, 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 okay, like, so, so it's not like, uh, it's not like we have to know that uh, that only um, uh, that there's only one of four places for the block to go, as opposed to only one of sixteen. We yeah. Okay. So the way to think of these is effectively, if your blocks, if 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 if, if the value of m over b, if um, right here, if m over b is equal to say something like um, ten thousand then maybe in practice it's going to look more like um, um, 2,000 instead. Right? Each of these is going to lose some, some constant factor. You're not going to quite get the, get the ideal cache, so you're not going to quite move things out in the, in the last possible, um, you know, in the best possible order. So that effectively makes your cache a little bit smaller. If your cache was twice as big, then you can be a little bit sloppier with which ones you throw out, and things will still work. The same thing um, with the with the full associativity. Um, if uh, if your block can't go anywhere, but you kind of have randomly stored the location of things, then the probability of it filling up earlier than it would have is smaller. So if your cache was actually bigger, then it it would have been probably would have been okay. So you probably have. So, so maybe this value is shrunk by constant, but so the bounds will be off by a little bit. Um, actually, a lot of the way these items are designed, they'll probably work very well if you use the least recently used. It'll look very much like an ideal cache. Um, and, and, and also, the, the full associativity, often you'll grab things in some sort of, um, some sort of linear order in how, they're, how they're, uh, the data is ordered in a way that's some sense linear. So th then just based on the way the cache stores them, they'll probably fit well in the cache, and the full associativity won't be a problem. So in practice, the decrease probably isn't going to be that much. But 
you can kind of think of you're just decreasing m over b by a constant. It's the effect of this. Um, th there's one more uh, assumption that you need um, is that, that you have a tall cache. And this is something we've, we've mentioned before that m is going to be greater than b squared. So this will be that m over b is going to be larger than b, basically. So, um, so it's, it's not always going to be so critical. The constant 2 here, you can maybe replace this by something, you know, instead of b squared, it could be b to the 1.5, and it's probably fine in, in most cases. Um, and, and this is not so unreasonable in most settings. Okay, so, so these are just to make, a, when you see any algorithms that are described under this model, they probably either, they'll, they may explicitly or implicitly be making these assumptions, and don't, don't be so scared by them. There, there are some assumptions you need to make the, the analysis work, but they're, uh, they actually aren't, aren't all that bad. Um, so, so, so tall is just, is just saying that, it's uh, you know it's it's large compared to the block size. You could it could have called it um, the large cache assumption instead of the tall cache assumption. Let's, let's try and say the same. Thing. Okay, so what's the simplest um, thing that we can do? Um, um, so scanning. So. I've got some large data set, and my goal is to find the max element of, of the data set. Um, in, the, in the idle model, I can do this with n over b items. Right? And, and, and actually, um, this should actually probably be n over b, um, n over b plus 1. Right? So I always need at least one IO. And you know, so that there's not really a hidden constant here in the, in the, in the big implementation. Um, can I do this in the IO revision, in the, in the cache oblivious model? What kind of bounds can I do for scanning? Are we allowed to know what N, or what N and B are when we, um, uh, when we Well, when you analysis? do the analysis, you can, but okay. not when you design the yeah, um, details. The, when you design the algorithm. You can assume. You can also assume that the data is going to be stored in um, um, that the data is stored in a um, um, in a contiguous um, you know part of of the disk. Right, so so I'm not gonna spread every single element of the data across different different parts of the disk. Alright, so if I don't know M and B, how well does does scan work? Uh, well let's think of the disk as being actually actually a tape. Okay, so it's you can think of it effectively as a, as a tape. So, um, like, if we're gonna design, if we're we're talking about the bounds now, right? Yeah. So we still can use M and B. Yeah, we we need to use M and B exactly. in bounds, right? Yeah, so yeah, but but I, not we, in how we design. We how can we do it. much better than that. Yeah. So 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 think of. But I mean, like when the last when when we we're gonna the the cache is gonna be full, the least recently use will come the new one. So and we won't use it anymore because we're just scanning. We just need to remember the right. largest element, which is one element in the whole cache. So, and this one is always going to stay in because it's going to be used any uh, all the time. So basically, we we'll, we we'll just maybe off by a little constant, but not much. Uh, right, right. So, so, so basically, you can think of you you um, you start scanning here, and you um, so this is your start, and this location is your end. And you have no control about how the how the blocks are, are laid out here. So it could be that 
the first element is here, and then you start this, this new block. Um, so it could be you have one element here and one element here. So th the worst case number of IOs is, is basically, basically going to be n over b plus one um, ceiling. Mm -hmm. So it can be off by, it's going to be off by basically possibly one more IO. Whereas if you knew the block structure, you would never start a file like at the last thing of a block. Right? But this is the only difference. Otherwise, you know, the, you're going to have the same, basically the same number of IOs as if you didn't know the block structure, right? So you can think of it as the data is on a tape, but every time you jump to essentially a random spot on the tape, that counts as, a, as an extra IO, right? But if you're just scanning continuously, you're going to view, you're going to grab just as many blocks are as needed, independent of what the block size is, right? So the larger the block size, the fewer IOs you're Right, so so I mean, so it's possible to do these um, these scanning stuff. Okay. Um, um, so in general, so the, the scanning is easy, right? So most algorithms do some form of divide and conquer. Right? So if we're doing uh, um, if we're doing the merge sort, um, th then um, what we want to do is to uh, or uh, maybe the quick sort's a better example. Um, we want to keep dividing until um, this size is um, less or equal to m, um, then we can um, solve in memory. Right, so, so in general, th this is kind of how a lot of the algorithms would be structured in the general model for the higher efficient algorithms. Okay, so we're going to keep dividing until the size is less or equal to m, and we, then we can fit everything in memory, and it doesn't matter how we solve it. So now this structure can can still be preserved in the um, in, in in the model for cache oblivious. Instead of you know stopping when we get a size m and just solving it by brute force, well, we can keep running divide and conquer. Um, and we just don't know when we've crossed the size of the threshold of the cache. This sounds like we're making an assumption that m is greater than some constant, so we just divide and conquer until we've reached the, uh, the constant. Yeah, so, so as I mentioned in some other lectures, often you want to divide till some constant and then do a brute force instead of actually keep dividing. Um, and knowing where that threshold is to do the brute force is some things you can, sometimes you want to ex figure out experimentally, um, sometimes if you know the block size or the cache size, you can actually, um, you, you can actually figure out what this is ahead of time. Though you may not want to do brute force on something that, that if it's like an n cubed algorithm that fits inside of the cache, right? Um, but so, so, so here, we don't know what the size of the memory is, so we're probably going to go down further you know, th than we would otherwise. And keep dividing. You can divide until the size is 2, right? Or un until the size is 1, and then you know, go back up. Yeah. And, and actually, which, which might be useful if the amount of RAM available to you varies from one second to another, depending on what other processes are doing. Uh, yeah, that's also a good point. Yeah, maybe I should add that to the list of the, the advantages here. Um, that the, the the RAM size may may actually m may vary while you're running other things. That's a good point. Um, the thing of going down to very small sizes when you're actually working on a GPU, you're going to have some parallel aspects as well. Um, you have multiple processors, but at the lowest level, actually, if you look at this diagram, the lowest level, the cache is actually really tiny. It's kind of like a like a 
like only like three, um, three uh, um, ints at a time or something like that, um, at the very lowest level. Um, you're basically just going to have the registers and a very simple CPU. So now, if you have a CPU in your computer, those things have lots of registers and a lot of memory associated built right onto the CPU, even in, in, even at different stages of the pipeline and everything. But on the GPU, they're they're really simple. So you may want to go all the way down to um, very small things. Um, okay, but what's what was the other thing that we were able to do in in the highly efficient model here in this divided conquer step that allowed us to improve the bounds that I have left off these two bullet points. They're, yeah? They're dividing multiple, not just two. Uh, that's right, that's right. We're able to get these log base m over b bounds with the higher um, base of the log. And this, this base is usually pretty big and it makes a pretty big difference. It makes usually the log term something like three. Whereas, um, whereas if, if n over b, this is large data, this term is big, the log term could be otherwise, if it was base 2, could be something like 100. Um, that's a factor of, uh, of 30, which, which really can make a difference. Um, so in, in, the, in, in the cache oblivious model, we often don't know what is the right split to be doing if we want to do a multi-way split. If we try and split too, too large, so, so, so what happens if we were trying to run, um, let's say we're trying to run um, the quick sort, right? And, uh, and the goal was we have this list and we're going to split into these smaller lists. Um, you know, each of these was going to be like a stack or a queue. And we have these, these splitters, right? So S1, S2, S3, or the, um, these, these pivots, right? So let's say we chose these four pivots because we thought we had five, um, M over B was five, but M over B was actually four. Um, so what would happen? So we're gonna try and have four of these queues, uh, five of these queues going at once when we only have enough room and memory for four of them. Yeah, right. Um, you're going to do a lot of um, it, it's going to do a lot of thrashing. If you wrote to these four and then had to write to the fifth one, you're going to have to go and pull the block you're writing to from disk. So it's going to be much slower. So if you overshoot the size of your memory by even one um, more than you can, it's really going to slow down your algorithm. And so. Unless you have some sort of bound on this, you're going to have to do um, just a two-way split. Okay, and if you're just doing a two-way split, you're not going to get as good bounds here. And so, for instance, so the bound um, for sorting is is only going to be um, n over.